I'll promote you. So I want to talk to everyone this morning who has a survival story. For everyone who's barely hanging on in life. For every time that someone says, how you doing, brother? We call you brother when we don't remember your name. Say, how you doing, brother? And you say, oh, I'm, I'm surviving. I want to talk to you this morning about if you survive. If you survive. The Bible says in Matthew 6.33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That verse always has stuck in my head. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And I begin to wonder, what is the kingdom of God? What, is, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you? See, and I'm convinced that what this verse is talking about is talking about if you survive. See, I'm convinced that in this world today, that as a Christian, we feel like our main objective is to get to heaven. That everything that happens in life, it's all a side, it's all a side effect. We just, we have to get to heaven. No matter what happens, we have to get to heaven. And I'm here to tell you that while that's true, I believe something just a slight bit different than that because heaven is an assurance. Heaven is a guarantee. Those of you that believe in Jesus Christ, I'm not saying that everyone goes to heaven before you kick me off the stage here, but I'm saying that those of you that believe in Jesus Christ and are saved, we're guaranteed heaven. So if we're guaranteed heaven, then that means that there's got to be some other reason why we're put on this earth. There's got to be some other reason why we're here. There's got to be something that we're supposed to do. And why is it so hard to get through life? Mm -hmm. See, I'm convinced that if our whole purpose in life was to get to heaven and be out of this world, the Bible wouldn't tell us in Genesis to honor your father and mother so that your life, your life would be longer. But see, what happens is we get so wrapped up with the things of this world. There's crisis in the Middle East. There's crisis in the economy. There's crisis next door. There's crisis in the airports. There's crisis everywhere you go. How do you survive this world? How do you survive this world? I'm here to tell you that surviving this world doesn't mean what you think. When I hear the word survival, I think of barely making it out. I think of squeezing through the door as it's closing. But I'm here to tell you that if you're to survive in this world, it looks nothing like barely making it out. See, have you ever just been in a place where you can't go on anymore? Where it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter who you talk to, it doesn't matter what you do at all. You just feel like you can't go on anymore. You feel like you've hit the bottom of where you're at and you're, you're down there and you're saying, God, where are you? You're supposed to be with me. See, I want to talk to the ones that have walked on their last battlefield. I want to talk to the ones who feel like it doesn't matter what's going to happen in this next stage of life, that it's never going to get better and it's never going to change. And I'm here to tell you that if you survive, God will promote you. If you survive, God will promote you. See, our lives are not a curse and they're not a mistake. I get so passionate sometimes when I speak because I, I believe that, that what God wants to do is so powerful in this world that I believe He's just waiting for us to get ready. Yes, and, and, and I get so wrapped up and so just, it almost seems like I'm angry, but as, as Reinhard Bonnke once says, when I see what the devil does to this generation, I don't want to purr like a kitten, I want to roar like a lion. Amen. See, there's an all-out attack, an all-out onslaught in this world for Christians. It doesn't, it used to be that it was, oh, if you're a Christian, that's fine. Just stay in your little corner. But now it's not even okay to be a Christian. There's an all-out attack against Christians in the world today. I've never seen anything quite like it in my entire life. But I'm here to tell you that if you survive, God will promote you. There's been so many times in my life where I've wanted to quit. I mean, I could tell you story after story of where it's just, all right, God, I'm done. I'm rolling over. I'm going to show my belly. I'm going to be done. <laughs> and you just can't. You can't go on. You can't fight anymore. You're just done. And every time at the last second when it's down to the wire, God comes through. And I'm convinced that our objective on this earth is to survive. See... I feel like in Christianity, what, what the world has tried to do is it's tried to make it about levels. 
The world always likes to take down the top Christian. If I can get to him, I don't need to worry about everyone else. But see, I'm here to tell you that Christianity is not a thing about levels. Because what happens when you make it about levels is you go, okay, I just got to get to the next level. I'm only like a level four Christian, so I can pray for the sick, but I can't heal the sick. Okay, now I'm a level six Christian. Now I can heal the sick, but I can't cast out demons. Okay, now I'm a level eight Christian. Now I can cast out demons, and now I can't do this. That's not what it's about. No. But we've become so convinced that Christianity is about levels. Oh, I wish to be like Him one day. Let me tell you something. I've met a lot of hymns. And I can tell you they're nothing without the power of God. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. I've been in a lot of green rooms and I've heard a lot of things. I traveled with an evangelist for a year who uh, just wrote two books for Charisma. And he's traveled around the world and all of these things. And I'm here to tell you that I've been in the private rooms. And I've heard the conversations of some of these hymns. And I'm here to tell you that they're people just like you and me. Now, it's one thing to strive after an anointing. It's one thing to say, you know, I want to I want to do things for God. But I'm here to tell you that the minute you put man on a pedestal, man will let you down. That's right. Amen. Amen. But if you survive, all of that junk aside, if you survive, becoming a hymn will be the last thing on your mind. That's right. See, it's a tricky thing to survive. I was reading a lot about survival stories and about people who have made it through, people who made it through hurricanes and through wars and prison camps and there's one thing that I found survival is tricky because it requires you to pay more than you ever thought you could pay but it rewards you with more than you ever think you could have you met I met uh, cancer survivors that they say you know what I have a new outlook on life now life is just this much more important to me men and women in the military that come back and they say everyone else I knew didn't come home, but I did. I survived. Survival is a tricky thing. Survival requires you to do things you've never done before. But I'm here to tell you that surviving, once again, is not what you think it is. Surviving is not barely squeaking by. There's so many preachers out today that say, Oh, you shouldn't survive this world. You should thrive in it. Ha! <laughs> Well, I'm here to tell you that's not sometimes how the world works. That's right. But I'm also here to tell you that we're not of this world. That the spirit that's in you and me is not of this world. That if I walk into a room, I'm not a thermometer, I'm a thermostat. And I set the tone and I set the temperature because my God told me that I can. Yeah, I'm here calling to all the Christians out there. That the world has forced them into a cave and said, stay here and don't come out. I'm here to tell you that if you survive, God will promote you. I looked up the word survive. It's a Latin word. It's a verb. It's an action. And it says to continue to live or exist, especially in the spite of danger or hardship. Now when I think about that, I still have this picture of surviving. Barely getting through. Don't look to the right or the left. You're going to survive. You're going to find just right here. But when I read that it says to continue to live or exist, especially in the slight danger of hardship, I'm reminded of a, uh, a POW camp in World War II on one of the Japanese held islands. That they rescued these men after the war was over, and some of these men, they were so malnourished, they weighed in the, in the, the 80s and 70s in their weight, and they were, they were full-grown men, but they looked like children. And they were interviewing these guys, and they said, how on earth did you survive? And they brought these reporters to this island, to this POW camp, and the commanding officer said, Sir, let me show you something. And he walked to the back and he rolled this piece of earth away. And he said, Crawl in there and you'll see. So the reporter got down on his hands and knees and he crawled in there. And he sat and he, he walked into a little bit of an open, open room where he could just barely stand up. And on the wall there was a picture of Jesus. And he came out and the commanding officer said, Sir, every time one of us was about to break and we could be tortured and tortured and tortured, but we couldn't handle any more, we shoved him in that room and we didn't let him out until he knew he would survive. Because just to look on the face of Jesus gave him hope. 
See, we live in a world where there's no hope. We live in a world where there's no passion for anything of God. We live in a, a world where the only thing that determines how much you're going to be in life is what's in your wallet. And that's not the way it should be. We live in a world without hope. We live in a world where when people hear the things going on in the Middle East, they get scared. When they hear about, about ISIS and the things going on, and we hear about the threats made against this country, they stop what they're doing and they crawl in a hole and hide. They have no hope. But I'm here to tell you that if you survive, if you survive, we will see the greatest revival this world has ever seen. Amen. Because it doesn't matter what happens in this world. Because if we're saved and we walk with Jesus, we have a guarantee of heaven. So that means we have a job to do on earth. If you survive. I looked up the word, when I, when I looked up the word survive, it said to continue to live or exist. I looked up the word live in the Latin and it says to make one's home in a particular place or with a particular person. I live with Jesus every day. Jesus isn't some place where I say, i got to go walk and meet Jesus, and so I walk into a church. No, 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 no. Jesus comes with me. When I'm in a supermarket, Jesus is there. That's right. When I'm walking around my house, Jesus is there. We went and saw a friend of ours that lives in Phoenix, and we walked into their new house. They're building a new home. And when I walked in, Jesus was right there, and I could feel him. And I looked at the guy, and I said, I know this is weird. I know this is crazy, but Jesus is in your house already. But see, this is the mentality that as Christians we have to get into is that it doesn't matter where we go, we bring Jesus with us. We don't have to go to meet Jesus. All we have to do is turn and He's right there. But see, there's been such an attack. There's been such a, a, a confusion among Christians. But I'm here to tell you that if you survive, there's no confusion. There's just triumph. I'm going to fly through this very quickly because I don't want to keep you, so I hope that, uh, I hope that you can understand my half-redneck babble. And if I say y'all, don't hold it against me. But I'm not a Cowboys fan, so that should make up for it. Oh, Sorry. Oh, I'm Sorry. They had an Ebola scare in Dallas uh, about a week ago. And someone asked me, what are you going to do if it comes to Houston? I said, I'm going to go to Dallas Cowboys Stadium. They don't catch nothing there. Oh. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm here to tell you that in order to survive, there's four things you must do. Number one is go. I'm reminded of a man named William Booth. He founded the Salvation Army. And William Booth, when he founded the Salvation Army, he founded it in, in England as a way to uh, save young youths. And he had different ranks set up. They, everyone that, uh, that was in the Salvation Army called him General, or General Booth. And General Booth would walk around England, and he would find homeless young men and women. And he'd walk up and he would say, do you want to make a difference in this world? And then, if they said yes, he handed them a backpack with a passport, money, and a plane ticket to a country that no one's ever heard of. And he said, go for souls and go for the worst. See, he would take these young, homeless, disenfranchised people and he would get them into a church, get them saved, and he would send them out. Go for souls and go for the worst. I love that. See, God has called us to live. God has not called us to squeak by. God has called us to live with a boldness and a power, not to hide in caves and pray for the rapture, but called us to be a light, to bring hope to those that have no hope, to bring peace to those that have no peace, because my God follows me wherever I go. So it doesn't matter if I'm in a church. It doesn't matter if I'm in a home. It doesn't matter if I'm in a, a sporting venue. All that matters is that Jesus is with me. Amen. God has called us to be an army. God has called us to survive. God has given us all the authority over this world and all the things over this world. And He has commanded us to do one thing. Change the atmosphere. Don't read it. If I walk up to a thermometer in my house and I say, make it cooler, I'm going to be very frustrated. And it is hot in Houston. Amen. But if I walk up to the thermostat and I decide to change the temperature, 
it'll change. So you're a chosen child of God, called to live in this world rather than just escape it. Christianity is not a get out of jail free card. It's a mandate. You're a son or a daughter of the king. You are given the greatest reward ever, and that is eternal life with Jesus Christ, but you have a job to do while you're here. See, so many times I feel like we think that Jesus is just for the four walls of the church. Well, I'm going to go meet with Jesus, but my employer doesn't like me to pray. Well, I'm going to go meet with Jesus at church, but my friends don't really like to hear about it. It's kind of weird. I went to a, a Christian college, and it amazed me the amount of people that went there that were not Christian. <laughs> and I remember sitting there one day, and, and, and this, I was in the bowling alley of this college, and, and this guy was watching the Victoria's Secret fashion show at a Christian private university. And I was mad. I was hot. And I walked up to a guy that had been mentoring me and walking with me. I said, I can't believe he's sitting there watching that in this Christian university. And he looked at me and he said, isn't it crazy when the world acts like the world, Pharisee? <laughs> Felt bad. Yeah. But I started to think about it and I started to say, you know what? Why does it surprise us so much when the world acts like the world? And I feel like it's because we've been so far in our caves that we've forgotten what the world looks like. But I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not for the four walls of the church. The Holy Spirit is not for, for just the believers. It edifies the believers. But I'm here to tell you that you can do things through the power of the Holy Spirit that you can never, ever, ever, ever do before. And it's for other people and for out there. That's right. If we live our whole lives just sitting there trying to build the church up, at the end of the day, we're going to have a whole lot of people. And that's it. And when the rapture comes and the church is empty, guess what? It's going to be filled with a whole lot more people who have no idea what's going on. I'm convinced that if we lived our lives with the assurance of heaven and with the authority given to us by the power of Christ, that you wouldn't have to ask people, are you a Christian? The place where I work so many times, everyone comes up, hey, do you want to go grab a beer after work? I'm good. Do you want to go, man, you want to go to this party? There's a rave going on now. I'm good. Man, why don't you ever go hang out with us? Because I don't need that. Well, why? Why? Why don't you need that? Because that's the only way I can get through my work week. See, that's a window. Let me tell you why I can come to work and I can smile. <laughs> Let me tell you why when I'm walking through the supermarket and I see someone crying, I say, what's wrong with you? What's going on in your life? Oh, you just don't understand this is happening, this is happening. That's fine. I may not understand. I may not understand what's going on, but I can tell you that I brought a solution with me. Yeah. That's surviving. But you have to go. Matthew 6, 15 through 18, the, the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not will be condemned. And these signs will accompany them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They'll pick up snakes with their hands and drink deadly poison and it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on people and they will get well. Can you imagine what it would be like to shut down a hospital with the power of Jesus? Amen. See, I have these crazy dreams sometimes. I'll be talking with my wife and I'll say, what if we did this one day? And then I say it and I go, oh, that's nuts. <laughs> and she looks right back at me and she'll say, why not? If we have the why not attitude, what do we have to lose? I'm reminded of watching the Houston Texans play. <laughs> Sorry, they're awful. Says and the they Cubs were playing. Fan. They were huh? Says the Cubs fan. That's not good. <laughs> Hallelujah. But they were playing last week, and I remember watching uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, and he drops back in the pocket, and he throws a bullet of a pass to DeAndre Hopkins. Hopkins makes this great one-handed catch, and it's amazing, and there's a flag on the play. And they walked up to Fitzpatrick after the game, and they said, man, how did you get that pass in there? And he looked right at the reporter, and he said, well, I knew that that was an offsides penalty, so we had a free play, so I figured, why not? What's the worst he could do, drop the ball? If the church were to have that attitude. Yeah. That instead of living not to die, we started living for the sake of living. 
Instead of living to get to heaven, we started living saying, you know what? If I'm going, I'm going to take a whole lot more with me. Go for souls and go for the worst. It doesn't matter if you think you're not qualified. You don't have to be qualified. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. That's right. I love what Romans says in, in, in the Message Bible. I read the Message Bible sometimes because it's simpler. It says, This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expecting, greeting God with a child like, What's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirit and confirms who we really are. We know who He is. We know who we are. Father and children. And we know we're going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We'll go through exactly what Christ goes through. And if we go through the hard times with Him, we're certainly going to go through the good times with Him. See, so many times we hide behind our faith that we forget that with faith comes action. I'll never forget walking up to a homeless man in the middle of Houston's winter last year, had one of the worst winters that Houston has seen in a long time. And I walked up to this homeless, we walked into a McDonald's actually, and, and it smelled of urine and it, and it smelled of body odor. And I looked at Ashley and I said, we're not eating here, let's go. And as I'm walking out, God called my attention through the window and there's a homeless man sleeping. I believe the temperature at that time was about 37 degrees. And so I walked back inside. I said, man, are you hungry? Let me buy you some food. And I bought him some food and I sent him on his way. And then I said, all right, Henry, let's go get something to eat and, and get on with our day. So we went and we found something to eat. But I couldn't get this guy out of my head. I said, God, what do you want me to do with this guy? I just bought him food. Isn't that enough? Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? And God said, go to Walmart and get a blanket and go talk to him. So I drove to Walmart and I got a blanket for this guy. By now the temperature was in the 30s, the low 30s. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, I want to give you this blanket, but I have to know what your name is first. He said, my name is David Roth. I said, David, Aaron, nice to meet you. I said, I have to ask you one question. How did you get here? And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, well, sir, I don't rightly know. He said, I'm, uh, my name's David Roth and I have a bachelor's degree in uh, computer-aided drafting. And I drafted some of the buildings that you see in downtown. He said, and then the recession hit and I lost my job and I ended up here. And I remember I asked him, I said, you have food, you have a blanket, what else do you need? He said, I just want a place to sleep where it's warm for once. See, I'm here to tell you that the world out there doesn't need a program. They don't need, they don't, they don't need all of this stuff stuff that we like to do. All they need is Jesus Christ and someone, who's care, and someone who cares. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. See, in this, this 20 minute encounter, I couldn't meet all of his needs, but I met a few of his needs. And then the one thing that just boggled my mind is that the only thing that he cared about was where he was going to sleep that night. He didn't worry about food. He didn't worry about a job. He wasn't worried about the economy or the Middle East or anything like that. He just wanted a place to sleep. But I'm here to tell you that if you survive, if you survive, if you survive, if you survive, if you live the way that Jesus Christ modeled for us to live, we would see a revolution like this world has never seen. If we went and did instead of just said, it would be incredible. C.T. Studd, a great missionary, said this. He said, some people wish to live within the sound of a chapel bell but I wish to run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. See, I'm convinced that in Luke when it says, I give you the authority to trample serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. Don't rejoice in this, that spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I love how Jesus says, don't rejoice that spirits submit to you. That would make me pretty happy. I'm just going to be honest. But he looks at him and in that moment he says, don't rejoice that spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven because this is what happens when your names are written in heaven. It shouldn't surprise you that demons submit to you. It shouldn't surprise you when you lay hands on people and sickness disappears. It shouldn't surprise you when you see people get up out of a wheelchair. It shouldn't surprise you. Because the power of God that God wants to release into this place 
The Acts 2, I will pour out my spirit on your sons and daughters. It's here and it's ready for the taking, but we have to be ready for it. Otherwise, it'll come. It'll come for a few years and leave like every other revival we've ever seen. But I'm convinced that the next revival that God wants to bring is going to last until he comes back. No more of this two and three year stretch as a revival and then someone gets prideful and someone falls. But we understand that revival comes from Jesus. And until Jesus comes back, we're going to keep doing what he told us to do. And when he does come back, that'll be the end of the revival. That's what I'm convinced of. See, because I want you to understand, like I said, that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Ephesians 2.10, where God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared for us in advance. John 15, 16, You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you should go bear fruit and your fruit should abide. Number two, and this is the biggest one, number two, the second thing you need to do if you want to survive is fear not. Jim Elliott was a, a missionary that went to uh, uh, a rare tribe in, in South America, I believe, and he ended up dying there. But he said this right before he got on the plane, and people said, what if you die? He said, he is no fool who gives up what he could never keep in order to gain what he could never lose. See, when you look at all these people that are survivors, you find out one thing, that at some point they stopped being afraid because they said, what do I got to lose? I'm here to tell you in Christianity, what have you got to lose? You can't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> what if they kill you? That means it's, I was doing something right. What if they don't listen to you? That's fine, they don't have to, I just have to tell them. Well, what if they think you're a liar? That's fine, I still have to tell them. Well, what if they don't understand what you're saying? Then I'm going to make it clear, and I'm going to make it simple. And if they, don't, if they still don't understand it at the end of the day, I'm still going to tell them. I'm convinced that the what is spirit is what holds us back from the what it could be. We look at it and say, what if this happens instead of what if God did this? What if you prayed for that person and they didn't get healed? What if God picked them up out of a wheelchair? What if you walked into someone's situation and said, this is what the word of the Lord is to you? What if they didn't accept it? Or what if you were right? The what is spirit. See, fear is the most powerful motivator in our life. It doesn't matter what happens. They call it the fight or flight syndrome. Fear is what decides which way you're going to go. When you react to fear, are you reacting saying, no, 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 no I'm done. I'm gonna, or are you going to rise up and you're going to say, what's the worst you can do to me? I love this. I love this. Acts 2024. 20, Paul is addressing the leaders in Jerusalem. And he tells them that he's going to go, or that he's addressing the leaders in Antioch. And he says, I'm going to go down to Jerusalem. And this is what the Bible says in Acts 20, 24. He says, and now I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me, if only I may use it to finish the race and complete the task given to me by the Lord Jesus. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. One of my other favorite, favorite quotes about fear not is in Philippians. It says that I eagerly hope and await that I will in no way be ashamed, but so now, as always, Christ may be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die as King. I'm here to tell you that if you are operating in, in the Spirit, you're supposed to operate and you're saved and you believe in Jesus Christ, then you have a, an assurance of heaven. So if this life is cut short by someone else's decision, what's the worst that could happen? Now, I'm not giving you an excuse to go out and get yourself into a situation that results in that. But I'm simply saying this. What if we had that mentality every day? That it doesn't matter. The worst they can do is send me to heaven. If they don't want to listen to me, that's fine. If they want to say I'm crazy, that's fine. I'm a little bit crazy, but I'm crazy for Christ. As Paul puts it, I am a fool for Christ. See, I feel like what happens sometimes, though, is we go through our life without Jesus in fear so that when we come to fear, we still have fear on us. So we exchange our, our robes of sin and our robes of death. And then we say, God, give me a white robe. But hold on, I got some chains of fear that I need to keep around my legs. If God is first in my life, if I believe that God is first and foremost in my life, I should not have to run every command of his through my filter of fear. 
But what happens is we get to this part where we become so consumed with what the world thinks that we forget about what God says. Guess what? They're going to hate you. They're not going to listen to you sometimes. They're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think you're wrong. And that's okay because they hated him first and they did it to him first. And at the end of the day, what matters is that you fulfilled what God told you to do. If he said speak and you spoke, so be it. If they didn't listen, they didn't listen. If you showed them love, if you preached the true gospel of Christ, if you did everything that Jesus has commanded you to do and they don't listen, I release you from that fear. Because you did what you were told to do. <coughs> See, the devil can't make you sin. Or the, if the devil can't make you sin, he makes you busy or afraid. Well, I can't get this guy to sin, so... I can't make him busy either because he knows he needs time with God. That's okay. I'm going to just put little fears in it. See, the devil can't create fear in you. What he does is he walks up to you and he says, what if this happens? And he walks off and he lets you do what you want to do. The human mind is completely susceptible to fear if you're not careful. Because you, you'll stop living because you're afraid. You'll stop surviving in this world because you're afraid. But what if, I mean, what if we lose people? I can't, we, we can't lose people. What if, what if people stop coming to our church? What if they stop coming to our small group? What if they stop coming to our house? Then they'll stop eating my wife's banana pudding. And if they stop eating my wife's banana pudding, then they're going to think that we can't cook. And then if they think we can't cook, they never want to hang out with us. And then we're going to lose. It's crazy. So what? The banana pudding is good, I promise. <laughs> but what happens is we get so consumed and motivated by fear that we lose sight of what we're looking at and we start looking, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if God did this that we were supposed to be looking at? See, I want you to understand that true revival, true, unshakable, God-bringing revival begins when we stop saying, what if this happens and start saying, what God is going to do. That's right. I've met so many preachers that they love to pray for the sick. You got a head cold? Come here, brother. In the name of Jesus. And there's a handicapped guy in the stall right over there that just sits there. Pray for him. I don't know if I have that kind of faith. I understand that there's a, there's, a, there's a twinge whenever it happens. There's always a, well, what if this doesn't happen? What if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't happen? It'll never happen if you don't pray. Amen. If you pray and it doesn't happen, pray again. <coughs> if you're doing what God told you to do and it still doesn't happen, then obviously that wasn't for you to see that person get healed, but it was for that person to see you pray for them. Walked into a, we were in a mall in Atlanta. And a, a busload of uh, blind people came in. And all the Forerunner students we got together, we're like, hey, we can go pray for them. Come on, yeah? And we got up and we're like, hey, I want to pray with you today. And he looked at me and he said, that's fine. Just don't pray for my sight to be healed. <laughs> you know you're blind, right? <laughs> you can't see. Wouldn't you like, want to see I mean, I think that would be cool. And I asked this guy, I said, what do you mean, what if we, you, you'll let us pray for you if we don't pray for your sight to be healed? He said, I don't want my sight to be healed. It's like, that is just crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, what can we pray for you for? I mean, like, that's the most obvious need that we can see. And he said, I'm not struggling with my blindness. I'm struggling with my insecurity and with my fear. Mm -hmm. I remember... Fanny, Fanny J. Crosby, who wrote the song Blessed Assurance. Y'all know that one? Blessed Assurance? I'm not going to sing it because that's just... Oof. <laughs> but Fanny J. Crosby was totally blind in both eyes. And they asked her, why have you never asked God to receive your healing? Why hasn't God healed you? And she responded to the reporters and she said, I don't want to be healed. They said, why on earth wouldn't you want to be healed? She said, because the first face that I'm ever going to see is the face of my Savior. What if? What if it doesn't happen? Who cares? What if you did it and it did happen? If you survive. Third thing we're commanded to do, and I'm almost done. The third thing we're commanded to do is do not conform. That one needs no explanation. 
You're in this world, not of the world. You're a thermostat, not a thermometer. You're a child of God. You're not someone who's lost and looking for an owner. You're not one of the people crying out in the end times, give me your last name. You were bought with a price. You have a last name. You have power and authority. And it's time to say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and exercise this authority. Which brings me to the last thing. You have to know your authority. I'm reminded of Acts 19, the seven sons of Sceva. I believe it's Acts 19. Don't quote me on that, but the story's in the <laughs> the seven sons of Sceva are Jewish leaders and they're walking around to demon-possessed people and they say, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches about, come out of him. And they do. And then one day they walk up to a demon-possessed man and said, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches about, come out. And the demon responds back and he says three things. I know Jesus. I know about Paul. And who are you? And the Bible said he over... That, they, this man, this one man overcame the seven sons of Sceva and drove them out bleeding and naked. I did a word study on what the demon said back to him. And in the Greek he says, I know Jesus. That word means I understand. It's so simple to him. It's just like, Jesus, I know what Jesus is. I know what that is. I know that I need to leave at that name. And I know about Paul. I've heard about what Paul has done. But who are you? The word who are you, the term who are you means I have no recollection of who you are. But see, I'm convinced that somewhere along the line, when they were casting out these demons, the demons stopped hearing in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches about come out, and all they heard was in the name of Jesus, and they left before they had time to finish. See, demons and Satan are not the opposite of God and the angels. That's right. Everyone's like, there's God and then there's Satan. No, 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 there's God. Yeah. And then there is a created being who was cast out of heaven because he got too prideful and didn't get light. He didn't like being used by God. And then there's angels that went with him. They're not equals. They're not opposite. We were driving home from a church in Atlanta and I began to pray and I began to say, God, why is it that the enemy still tries to do things in this world even though he knows he's going to lose? And God showed me a vision. There was a divider separating two chessboards. And on one side of the chessboard was Satan. And on the other side of the chessboard was Jesus. And I begin to look, and on the side of the divider that Jesus was, there was two chess boards. There was the one that he was playing, and there was the one that showed the end of the game. And on the enemy's side, there was one chess board. And every time Jesus made a move, he said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And every time Jesus watched Satan make a move, he said, that's fine, you can move there. i got the other one right here. This is how it's going to end. This is what's going to happen. Devil, you can crucify me on a cross. You can come and you can take my life. You can make me a laughing stock of all the world. But it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, I'm going to come back and every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess and everyone will say that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you survive, God will promote you. If you survive. So you have to know your authority. We've reduced authority to the loudest voice in the room. You hear someone come up, well, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> That's my impersonation of Texan. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens is they come into the room and they're like, okay, you got the floor. But see, the one thing I love is that Jesus Christ, when he walked this earth, do you know there was one group of people that he took authority over? That he walked up and he said, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to do it. This is how it's going to be done. One group of people. Do you know who it was? The disciples. Jesus Christ never walked into a crowd and said, listen to me right now. This is what you're going to do. He walked into a crowd and they said, I need to listen to this man. That's right. Because this guy's got something behind him. I don't know what it is. It's not his clothes. It's not his entourage. It's not his, his fancy suit. It's not his Learjet. It's not his... Pay $10 into this ministry, get a free t-shirt, get $100,000 maybe. It's not anything like that. They said, there's something inside of that man that I have to listen to. He didn't do it with the Pharisees. He told them the truth, but he never, he never forced them to obey. He never told the Pharisees and the sinners, get behind me, Satan, but he told it to Peter. Because he knew, he understood that his authority came from Jesus Christ. Everything that I have seen, I have seen my Father do is what Jesus would say. And at the very end, He said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me and I give it to you. And we said, great! We have authority. This is what we're going to do. True authority knows when to be silent. That's right. 
True authority is a servant of the people. Right. True authority says, you know what, I'm going to get kicked on, I'm going to get spit on, I'm going to get beaten, I'm going to get abused. But at the end of the day, I'm still going to love you. And I'm still going to tell you the truth. And I'm here to tell you the true authority is not found in a loud voice. But it's found in a humble heart. It's found in a meek spirit. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. True authority is not walking up to a sinner and beating them over the head with your Bible in the name of Jesus and they get saved. True authority is saying, you know what? You're a sinner. So am I. I'm going to love you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to endorse your sin, but I'm going to show you the way to the light. And when you come to the light, I'm going to treat you the same way I've treated you the whole time. That's right. Amen. It's not about treating a sinner like a sinner, getting him into church and then saying, Whew, thank goodness I can treat you like a brother. No. Man, I was scared for a second, but but I can treat you like a human being now. No, 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 no. You can love a person without endorsing their sin. That's right. I've worked with some of the most whew, intense sinners that I've ever met. And the one thing they always ask me when they find out I'm a Christian is, oh, I guess you hate me now. No, 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 I don't hate you. Because I was where you were. Because I'm, I'm the worst of the sinners. Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you 1 Timothy 1.15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the worst. But this, for this very reason, Christ showed me love. That in me, the worst of sinners, Christ's glory may be fulfilled. Amen. Mm, it doesn't matter what you've done. It don't matter what you can't do. It don't matter what you think you can do. It don't matter what you think you're good at. It don't matter what you think you're bad at. If you only do what God tells you to do, you're going to survive. And if you survive, God's going to promote you. It may be rough right now, and I understand. I've been in some places in life where it's rough. But at the end of the day, if you keep your head down and you keep saying, I'm going to do the last thing that God told me to do, and I'm going to do it until He tells me to do something different, you're going to be okay. Amen. You're going to be okay. If you just wash feet until God says, get up and leave, you're going to be okay. But I'm here to tell you that if you try and take up something before it's your time, the, the, the calling of God without the timing of God will result in the absence of God. And I've seen many, 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 many great people who could change the world and who could do something, be confronted with a situation and they say, you know what? I'm going to do this instead. And it's a long time before they come back to it. I was one of those people. So you have to go. You have to fear not. You cannot conform. And the number number four, the, the fourth thing you have to do in order to survive in this world is you got to love. The greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. You and I are called to love. And what we've done in this world is, is we, teach, we teach Christians to hide while radicals teach their people to die. We tell Christians, hey, just hide. Just keep your head down. Heaven's coming. Rapture's coming. You're good. And all the other religions around the world are saying, go forth, be bold, and die for what you believe in. Let the other guy die for his country. I'm going to live for mine. Let the other guy die for what he believes is right and go to what he thinks is the afterlife. I'm going to live on this earth because God told me to live. And at the end of the day, when I cross through the pearly gates, if there's something that I haven't done, I'm going to regret it. But I know, I know that I know that I know that I know that I know if I've done everything in this world that Jesus Christ has commanded me to do, then when I get to heaven, there's going to be a screen on this side of everything that I did in life that He told me to do, and there's going to be a screen on this side that's everything I could have done if I were to listen to Jesus, and I hope that, that one's blank at the end of the day. Amen. Loving people is weird. It's messy. It's dirty. It's awful. It requires you to get in their filth. And it requires you to say, you know what? I'm in your filth, not of your filth. Amen. I love you. I hate your filth, but I love you. I think of the Good Samaritan. And everyone likes to talk about the Good Samaritan. Brought him to an inn. And he gave money for people to take care of him. No, 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 no. The Good Samaritan came up to this man on the side of the road, ble bleeding, bloody, and dying. And he said, Oh, 
I need to help this person. And he gets down and he starts dressing his wounds. He starts taking off his cloak and wrapping it around this blood-stained person. He puts him on his own donkey and walks beside his own donkey to the end. Puts him in the end, gives him his own money to the innkeeper and says, I'm going to be back for him. You just wait. But the thing that people look over is they say, oh, the Levite walked around him and the Pharisee walked around him. But the Good Samaritan did something. But the Good Samaritan left looking exactly like the other man. I've never been in a situation where I've seen blood spilled where I haven't been, it hasn't gone on me in some sort of fashion. But see, that's love. That's down home, dirty, nasty, grimy, dirty love. That's the kind of love that Jesus Christ wants. That's the kind of love that's going to change sinners. That's the kind of love that's going to change this world because it's no more, why do you hate me? It's how could you love me this much? Let me tell you how I can love you this much, man. Because a long time ago, someone loved me and I didn't deserve it. Just like you didn't deserve it, but I loved you. You have to go. You have to fear not. You can never conform. And you have to love. And if you do those things, you're going to survive. And God's going to promote you. Because if we were to sit here and hide for the rest of our lives until Jesus came back, yeah, we'd get to heaven without a scar. But what would we have done in life? There's two dates on your tombstone. The date you were born and the date you died. And there's a dash in between those two that sums up your entire life. At the end of the day, when you're looking at those screens in heaven, of what you, could, what you did do and what you could have done, what screen is going to be playing longer? I hope, I hope that that's the screen playing longer. Because the world doesn't need me to hide anymore. The world doesn't need me to be afraid. The world doesn't need me to conform. The world needs me to be an oak of righteousness, as Isaiah says. And the waves are going to crash on me. And the people are going to come and try and cut me down. But at the end of the day, I'm going to stand firm. And it's not because I'm anything great. I'm a wretched, awful sinner, but I was saved by grace. And I was given sonship and authority. And I know who my daddy is. Right. And I'm going to stand here and I'm going to say with absolute boldness and absolute power that it doesn't matter what happens in your life, that God loves you, He wants to save you, and He's got a plan for your life, and you could do more than you ever imagined if you only open your heart. Amen. Go. Fear not. Do not conform and love. And you'll survive. And if you survive, God will promote you. I want everyone to stand at your feet. Worship team.